Hello, interwebs. It is I, Hewlett, David Hewlett, with a, what we shall call a superhuman email of awesome awesomeness for you today. And uh, since geniuses don't always have the sight or the time to read, I thought I would, I would create a little audio awesome for you, for your viewing and, and listening pleasure. Uh, I realize I, these are sometimes very dense. There's a lot of stuff in my head. I like to put it down on paper. I'm really enjoying these, but I understand that that is a big commitment for some people and um, uh, myself included. Uh, so I just thought I would do an audio version of these, and I'm, I'm hoping that it's going to be of some some use to people. And uh, so, you know, let me know if it's working or not working. It's not a very, much of a studio setting. I understand there's all sorts of uh, bumps and crashes and cars going by and stuff, but uh, but I hope it uh, at least gets the, gets the point out. So let's dive in. Man versus machine in the drone dome. This was inspired by an article in the IEEE Spectrum magazine, which I love, which is just a, just wonderful sciencey stuff, engineering stuff. Um, it was entitled "Superhuman Speed: How Autonomous Drones Beat the Best Human Racers," and caught my eye, and it did not disappoint. I've got to say, um, you know, science technology are all very cool and all, but you know, nothing makes them more awesome than high speed chases, human versus machine battles, and spectacular crashes. This had all of that. I mean, it literally sounds. I was sort of joking about it being like a, a Hollywood movie. It would be, uh, you know, I was like writing pitches for it: an epic battle that pits the best of the best human drone pilots with their lightning fast reflexes and hard earned survival instincts as they battle the relentless AI racers with their deadly cool data driven machine logic and calculating precision. A tale of triumph and tragedy as humans lose their edge against the relentless onslaught of AI controlled machines. Shivers. I'm just I'm telling you, someone's got to make that movie. Uh, they have like a thousand times. Anyways, this is happening in the real world. I, I'm sort of fascinated by the whole concept of drone racing itself. I didn't sort of know it existed. It's amazing that I really didn't know it had taken such a, that it had such a, a place in in society and all, and we're already replaced by AI before I even found it. So, um, so what's the story here, Obsolete Human? The SWIFT system, that is the name of the system that runs the AI racers that we're racing against the human racers. Uh, it's from uh, Robotics and Perceptions Group at the University of Zurich, so you can blame them, uh, UZH or UZH. Um, they're just, this AI makes these drones faster and um, more aeronautic. They're this, you know, their aeronautic skills are, are, you know, they just, you can't, humans just can't be as precise as these things are. Um, but there are still some things they can't do. And I, you know, which I guess gives me a certain amount of hope, but you know, it's things like, you know, human racers can, can figure out when, you know, when, when it's, when they've collided with another drone and they can, they can get themselves back in the race again. Um, you know, if an AI drone hits something that it wasn't expecting, you know, that's a much more difficult problem for it to solve. And so often that will, that will take them out of the race entirely. The AI is also using a feed of sensors from all over the course. So they're basically cheating because uh, the humans are using just a little tiny camera, a little first, per first person view uh, camera that, through goggles. Uh, not always the best connection because these things are moving at ridiculous speed. So you get a little you get a little jitter to the frames and the and a little fritzing and stuff. So they're piloting these things through these crazy courses. They really, I mean, they held up well, but it's definitely reminded me of that. Was it the steam hammer versus that guy? They, they had to battle. They tried to battle each other out. Of course, you can't beat the machine. They, well, it's the same case here. Um, but what comes from it is that. Uh, is just is just how these systems are learning and getting better um, and uh, at, at at piloting this stuff. There's this wonderful moment in one of the videos where uh, I call it a wonderfully weirdly telling moment where one of these world class drone pilots is so cute. He gets so excited, like for the AI, like the AI finishes the course. And it's like he's like, oh, my God, it's so great. You know, it's just completed the 75 meter course in like 5.3 seconds. And, and the guy's like, oh, my God, that was beautiful. You know, maybe my, my one day, you know, my dream is to one day be able to achieve that, he says, you know. So it's this kind of, I mean, talk about the difference between the machines and the humans. I, there's something to us humans. I don't know what it is, but, but um, it's, it's neat because, like, right away in, like, a race between a drone and a human, the first, you know, right out of the, right out of the gate, I mean, it takes a human 220 milliseconds to hear a noise and react to it. 220 milliseconds. The AI can launch in less than 100 milliseconds. So right, right out of the gate, they're already halfway down the course. So it's, 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 uh, it, was, uh, it was an interesting thing. There's also some amazing footage. Watching these things do the course is 
it's almost scary how amazing the AI is at doing it when he gets it right and how spectacular they fail when they, when they get it wrong. But um, uh, this also, of course, put me down the rabbit hole of the whole idea of drone racing. And I didn't know this, but there's a whole drone racing league. And, uh, you know, what are they called? Uh, DRL.io. Uh, and you've got to check this out because they've got, I mean, they've got all sorts of information on how to get into it, how to build these things, how to maintain them, uh, strategies. They've even got a simulation program. It's not a game. No, no, this is a simulation program. It's a training simulation uh, where you get to practice your feeble human piloting skills and, and then not wreck the place in the process. So I'm looking forward to doing that. I might even try doing that on one of our one of our Tech Bandit streams because uh, that just seems like kind of a fun thing for me to screw up for you. Um, another company that's doing similar stuff, obviously, is First Robotics, um, but they're taking a slightly different tact. First Robotics, this is the company that um, was created by the inventor Dean Kamen. Um, who invented the Segway. And the Segway, most people don't know, was originally a wheelchair. It was a wheel, it was a, you know, like a, a wheelchair that they, that he called, that could sit up and beg. And the idea was that it would transform from a regular wheelchair into a standing, self-balancing uh, Segway type uh, robot uh, that would just bring people in wheelchairs up to eye level, um, bring them up to, to the level of a walking human, which is a big deal because the reality is, think about it. No matter where you go, you're sitting in a chair. You are always being spoken down to. You're always being talked down to. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't mean on purpose, but I mean, the, but there's a physicality to it. It just is going to make you stand out in a crowd uh, by sitting. Uh, so the idea that this this robot, this the robot was the idea was that this robot would allow people to 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 interact with the with the the walking world. Um, and, um, and then of course it, it led to this, this segue invention as well, which, which was some people find a bit silly, but anyways, um, point is he really wanted to create rock stars out of, he wanted like rock star inventors, rock star, uh, robotics engineers and such. I mean, you know, not just sports stars, not just, not just rappers and stuff. He wanted, he wanted to turn scientists into rock stars, which I think is a really cool idea. Um, and, and they sort of focus on the building of these robots as much, just as much as the competition, really. So the whole process is part of this first robotics competition, not just the actual competition itself. Um, and this was the this was the uh, this was the competition that Lord Chunky was uh, was competing in at the uh, Robots of the CNE Canadian National Exhibition a little while ago. I spoke about it in a, in a previous uh, a previous Tech Bandits. Um, and uh, first robotics has a mission, which I'm going to read to you. It's a, it's a it's a bit grandiose and maybe a little, a little pretentious, perhaps. But I, I gotta say, listen to this. So their mission is to inspire young people to be science and technology leaders and innovators by engaging them in exciting mentor-based programs that build science, engineering, and technology skills, and that inspire innovation and that foster well-rounded life capabilities, including self-confidence, communication, and yes, leadership. Uh, it's a bit long winded, but you know, dang, it's, it, that's like everything I would like tech bandits to be. So I will have to plagiarize some of that. Cause I think it's just a fantastic, a fantastic way of putting it. Um, I would make it shorter, maybe despite how much I talk, I think I'd make it shorter, but, um, I definitely get the word leadership in there for sure. Um, now speaking of Lord Chunky, we're still waiting with bated breath as to what's going to happen with the robotics club, because this was a school robotics club. The teacher who kindly donated all the time to be there for this club is no longer at the school. So shocking as this was for me to learn, apparently they just have to see if there's a teacher who's willing to not get paid to do extra time after school and on weekends to run a, a robotics club with a bunch of kids. And I'm like, what? It's literally dependent on you finding someone who's already overworked to come in and do extra work. Uh, good luck with that. Uh, so there's that. And then the other thing that's come up recently is that there's this, the school has allegedly they've, they've, they've banned power tools. Like they're not no longer, kids are no longer allowed to use power tools, which is funny because the robot that Lord Chunky was working on was capable of twisting and snapping like an inch of steel. Like that thing is, that thing makes power toys look like baby toys. You know what I mean? I mean, it's, it's, it, it, these things are, these things are amazing and the kids are smart. They're not. I mean, yes, I'm sure accidents will happen. Yes, I'm sure that there's there will be concerns about things, you know, insurance and that kind of stuff. It got me thinking, though, if he can't have a robotics club at the school, 
this is a job for tech bandits. This has got tech bandits written all over it. I mean, we should have a tech bandits robotics club. And I thought, there's no way in hell I can afford that. But how about this? This is my pitch. What if we do this is wonderful show that my son has introduced me to called called Welcome to Wrexham, where uh, Ryan, Ryan Reynolds and uh, and uh, Rob McElhenney from uh, It's Always Sunny in, in, in Philadelphia buy this sort of old soccer club and and sort of put some money into it, start trying to get it back into its former glory. And it's just a wonderful series. It's like a great feeling series about the town and how the town sort of rallies around them. And although nervous and perhaps a little suspicious and and just, the, you know, this wonderful contradiction between these movies, these Hollywood movie stars and these and these soccer fans. Um, and it, it's just a it's just a beautiful show. And I thought, what? Here's my pitch. My pitch is what if you take that old, grumpy old Stargate genius and you he buys a robotics club. And of course, it's filled with kids who are all smarter than him. And it's his, the process of me trying to run a, a robotics club. Um, and I just think that would be, I would watch that. I think that would be fun. I think that'd be fun. It'd be a great way to actually fund this, this thing. Cause it does require, it's like 8K just to sign up for this thing. Um, and then you got to get the robots and the, and the, the, the components and stuff. And I'm sure there'd be lots of different travel expenses and things. Anyways, point being is, I get totally over my head and and hopefully we pay for it with a with a with a reality show or maybe it's just a YouTube channel who knows but I I am I'm convinced that that in my future there may be a robotics club because I I I just can't imagine the waste if these kids aren't aren't able to do this anymore because they can't find a, a someone to volunteer for it. I mean I I would I've said oh great I'll volunteer. No problem. Problem solved. Except that I can't. It's got to be a teacher. Like it's, it's again. There's all sorts of rules and regulations. It's you know, Toronto District School Board stuff, which I'm sure they've got their reasons for it. But it just seems kind of frustrating. This stuff is isn't happening in the school as part of the education program. I don't understand why, you know, these people are being asked to 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 do even more work only for free to run this thing, which would just so obviously be such a great part of an academic process for these, for these kids. So anyways, so that was my idea. And then if that fails, I think we should do a death race 2000 version where instead of the robots just racing around tracks, they race around tracks and they battle bot at the same time. So you got to win the race, but you can also take out your opponents with like giant hammers and chainsaws and stuff. I think that'd be fun too. So point being is I got, my brain is filled with a there's like a robotic battlefield of competing ideas right now, but they all involve like cool slow mo and and uh, you know bright LEDs and or, or unicorn vomit as we call it, and uh, and of course dry ice. You got to have lots of smoke and steam and all that kind of stuff. Maybe maybe some sparks too, that kind of stuff. So anyway, so that's that's the plan. Uh, now other types of gaming, Roblox. Build me a game is the next section, and this is about Ro- surprising little company Roblox. I should say right off the bat, I actually bought some Roblox stocks. Because I do my little dabbling every so often at these things, and and I bought a few Roblox stocks because I I'm I'm just sort of constantly surprised by this company. Like it's it's you know it it gets knocked down, it gets back up again, and and I keep my son, I keep finding Baz, you know, roaming around some thinly veiled copyright infringement of a of a of an anime world that's being created on on Roblox, and and it's he's thoroughly enthralled and enjoying it with his friends and cracking up and just having a lot of fun so i i just you know i'm just i'm sort of intrigued by it well they've just announced this ai language coding assistant which is a natural language programming language it's not a language sorry it's a it's basically a chat gpt type approach to to programming where you could say to roblox uh, i perfect example build me a death race 2000 uh, you know uh, racing course with burning trees and decrepit buildings and and put in four competing vehicles anyway i'm not sure how complicated you can get but the point you get my point you can tell it what to do what to build and it will build it for you in the roblox system um and i just thought what a great great way of making it easier for people to create content there's a certain snobbery amongst programmers which i do understand you know, you spend a long time learning how to use programming language. I use a lot of programming languages all the time. I dabble in all sorts of different languages, always have, always loved it, always sucked at all of it because I, there was never, never a focus on any one on one language. I never used one long enough. I, you know, I never used it daily the way programmers do. So never got particularly good at it. But what I've discovered these days is using ChatGPT, I can, it, I can have it walk me through the process of, of building 
programs, mainly in Python is what I've been using it for. But it could do just about anything. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know what language it has specifically, but it seems to have an awful lot of them. And it'll talk you through the, the packages you need. It'll talk, and then if you understand a little bit about programming yourself anyways, if you understand a little bit about Python, like I've sort of come to, to learn, you can say things like, oh, I don't want to use that package. Use this package instead. Or, or instead of, instead of um, trying to scrape that data without opening the page, actually open the page and pretend you're clicking through and that kind of stuff. So um, I was using it to do some some data collection for science fair information. I wanted to get a sense of, I want to get a sentiment of like a youth, the youths, the youths sentiment of what, of you know, how they felt about the future I thought would be kind of interesting and what they saw as important in the future based on what science fair projects that they'd put out. And so I was trying to get this data from a bunch of different sources and put it together. And, and Python was amazing at it only because chat GPT walked me through everything. And what I discovered was it's not perfect. And you do need to know how to run run the programs and, and obviously to, to debug them and stuff. But it's very good at getting you a good chunk of the way there. And also, if you don't understand any code, you ask chat GPT to explain it to you and it will do that. Uh, so I've just found it absolutely invaluable. I think the future of programming is absolutely going this way. I mean, you know, they didn't just, they don't, I feel like in some ways people think like computer programs were designed to be difficult to read, but they're not supposed to be. It's all about trying to make it easier and easier for humans to interact with. Otherwise we'd just be programming in ones and zeros like a computer. So the reality is every step you get away from that is just an easier experience for humans. And if you can get to the point where you can just talk to something and have it talk back to you and walk you through what you're doing and what could be working and not working and debugging the whole process. Um, it's just amazing. And I, I've heard that, that GitHub's uh, Copilot's amazing for that too. Excuse me a second. <coughs> yes, I'm in the dusty Canardian cavern garage here. So it's, uh, yeah, no studio settings for me. No sweat. I got to save my money for robots clubs. Um, so... Point is, I think Roblox has made an interesting sort of foray into this stuff, and I'm curious to see if other, like, you know, maybe I wouldn't be surprised if we see Epic Games having their Unreal Engine, same thing, um, be able to do some some more natural language stuff. Um, I would highly, highly recommend if anyone's got any interest in programming at all or wants to just automate a little this or a little that, try it out on ChatGPT and have it walk you through how it's done. It's 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 a it's a great it's a great little tutor i've got to say all right time for some coffee sipping coffee oh by the way sipping decaf coffee mhm mm what's the point you say me too but i'm trying i'm trying to i'm trying to knock out my caffeine for a while which is well possibly forever we'll see I've decided to get as boring as possible. Okay, so uh, Roblox, they did have a few other announcements, including a video chat feature, which is kind of neat. The idea is basically, you know, you're doing FaceTime, except that you're your avatar is from Roblox. So you can be dressed up as Naruto or whatever the whatever the One Piece or whatever the latest, but whatever the kids are into. Um, and you can have that chat happening within a Roblox world. So you're, you know, you're running around the world chatting with your friends and you're, you're, you're able to actually have a conversation. If it works as well as it looked, I, I'll, I'm quite impressed. I mean, I'm sort of looking forward to what you could do with it. And I think there's a certain amount of fun there. I, I wonder from an educational standpoint as well, if it could be kind of neat, you know, imagine doing classes in a video game. Like that'd be kind of, it could be kind of neat and also impossible to, to <laughs> impossible to keep on track. What am I saying? I've talked myself out of that already. Anyways, um, you know, that's the thing that I think a lot of the press is talking about is the idea of the that they are going, that they're basically moving into, they're going to stepping on Zoom's toes now with their with their own platform. They've also got this other feature, which I really like, which is they're they're talking about selling selling custom made avatars and stuff. So you can there's a marketplace on Roblox where you can buy custom made weapons and custom made you know masks and stuff and and you know, artifacts and things. And uh, so they're again, they're making that, trying to make that a little easier for people to do, and and they're and they're sharing a big chunk of the proce uh, of the proceeds. So basically, I think if you buy, if you if you're if you build something and sell it within your own world, you get like seventy percent of it. Something. So anyway, it's just, it's just a way kids can earn some college money. I'm saying, but as I say, I mean, I'm obviously excited about it because I also I also own stocks. They've all gone down, by the way. My stocks, they've all tanked from from the moment I bought them. But anyway. Um, so uh, there we go. What's up next? Roblox. Um, uh, Roblox out of the way. Uh, let's go with there's no way out. But I was very clever. I spelled it with K-N-O-W. There's no way out. It's, it's, it's like an escape room thing. Uh, Fortnite. Fortnite has, I don't know when they started this. And I couldn't, it's very hard to find 
I couldn't find a, a chronology for this stuff. I, I went looking for it. Um, but they've introduced this these themed escape rooms that you can use in in creative mode. Um, uh, maybe it's maybe it's not just creative mode. I'm not sure, but that you know you can earn extra points and extra skins and all this kind of stuff for the for the game. Um, you know, and Fortnite's definitely sort of not as popular as it used to be, but it's but it's you know it's it's still up there. And and I'm sort of looking forward to playing with with the idea of escape rooms because obviously with escape room learning, I think it's an opportunity here that maybe we can get some video game stuff into the real world and and vice versa and um uh, i think there's some i think there's some fun things to play with there and speaking of escape room learning i had a meeting a chat with this fabulous university of toronto professor who was so supportive and i dare i say excited um uh, and had some just fantastic ideas because of course you know she's brilliant um, about uh, about how escape room learning could sort of come to be. And she's got these grad students um, that she sort of needs to put to work every so often. And, and so maybe not this I don't know, semester or this year or whatever it is. Um, but, but potentially the next, we could look into having them create um, some some test scenarios and some put together some documentation and, and do a few sort of like research tests on how this could work, uh, whether it works. You know, we see we think it probably will work. Um, but you never know. I mean, and there's certainly things we can learn about optimizing it and making it better for, for, for kids. The idea basically is that they've used escape rooms in learning before, you know, kids solving puzzles and all the rest of that. That's, that, that's obvious. What I don't think is obvious, but which became obvious to me in my enjoyment of the escape room stuff was the building of them. I felt that it's a wonderful way of bringing together many different types of, of, of learning and, and also different curriculum, like areas, streams of curriculum could all be used together in building an escape room. It's got physics, it's got drama, it's got maths, it's got, um, you know, um, uh, gym, it's got storytelling, it's science, physics, you know, it's just got everything. So, and we're going to start with biology just to make it really difficult for ourselves. So I think that's where we're going to go with that. But they'd also, they also liaise with kindergarten to grade 12 students with the, with the, um, the school system and be able to sort of do some run some trials and stuff and just see how it works so that would be amazing because then we sort of put together some research data and then we've got sort of a little package we've got like some we've got some we got some learning that we can bring in uh to sort of try to make a more extensive uh program sort of down the road this is a great first step and i'm just really sort of flattered and excited that that, that she's taking an interest in doing this so uh, so fingers crossed on that uh that hopefully it won't just be Fortnite escape rooms for me it'll actually be some some uh, some some learning stuff in the in the universities as well. So and and what's what's lovely is uh, she said that um, that I can I can document this and I can obviously be a part of it. Um, um, I mean, she said, well, you brought it to me, uh, so I can't get out of it now. Uh, but the idea is that you know I I feel the academics can run with the with the academics, but maybe I could I could do some little documenting of this stuff and it'd be kind of a fun thing to keep track of and stuff. So so there you go. Lots to discuss on our next Tech Bandits, which will be uh, Friday. September the 15th, 2.30-ish, probably on Twitch, but uh, I'll keep you posted on that. Uh, thank you so much. I hope this works for you. Uh, I will continue to try to do Audible Awesome every week. And, um, yeah, let me know if there's things I can improve or or, uh, or suggestions. I will happily take them. Uh, so join me on Friday. And until we geek again, I will say be safe, be kind, be brilliant. A cheerio and huzzah. Thank you all very much. Cheers.